there's always some asshole in the crowd who says, how do you make money? Okay? Unless you're willing to write a check, you don't get to ask that question. So there's only about three guys in the room that get to be assholes. Okay? And I will point them out. Um, okay, so first up, we have Tom Short from Kudos. Tell us what you're demoing tonight. You betcha. Kudos is a corporate social network that has a recognition engine at its core. We developed Kudos uh, several years ago at my advertising agency as an in-house solution to create employee engagement. What we discovered once we built the item in-house is all of our clients started asking if they could use it. So we took it out for a little uh, test run and found out that uh, the market at large actually quite liked the product and it was a unique solution. And then last year we have decided to go into it full time. We started developing Kudos 3.0 in March of last year. We relaunched it this year in October, in October of 2011 uh, at the Motivation Show. And we're currently now signing up all of our beta clients and going through our efficiency stage of refining the product. Are you guys looking for money, looking for employees, looking for customers? Funny you should ask, Pat. Yes. <laughs> clients at this point in time, marquee clients, ma mainly local so we can continue to work with them. So talking with groups like Shaw and Suncor and today we gave a nice demo to the Globe and Mail and, and we're finding people pretty well uh, weekly that are interested in the product. And they're coming to us through uh, surgeons and marketing and social marketing and PR that we're doing. We haven't really launched our, our large uh, aggressive marketing campaigns yet. But uh, the next step for us now is to get through our next fundraising round so we can really go hard and start to scale. All right. So five minutes, Tom. There we go. All right. So kudos. Think different. Kudos is a corporate social network with a recognition engine at the core. What we've done is we've taken uh, the ideas behind a book called First Break All the Rules, which the Gallup organization wrote, and they, they defined 12 essential uh, elements that you need to have in your company to engage employees. And what we've tried to do here is automate it. So if you really look at it, it's kind of like Facebook and LinkedIn had a baby. And it, you can go in here and you can pick anyone in your organization, peer to peer, and send them a nice kudos message uh, to tell them what they did, any act, effort, attitude, or result that they got in the company, and send them points along with that, the kudos points. And the kudos points are broken into a, a defined structure of five, 10, 20 and 50. The reason we did that is we also want people to be able to monetize those points if they wanted to give them out as dollars as a bonus system. And it can be applied to a rewards program as well as just being a good collaborative tool internally. So for instance, if I wanted to send a kudo to someone in my office, say Mooney, uh, you know, I'll just, if I could even type, I don't have my glasses on. So, so we, you know, we got the auto-populate feature nice and handy. We can jump in here and say, good job. And then we have these characteristics and values which our customers can actually modify so that you can reinforce what's important to your company so that every day uh, when you are sending kudos and people are receiving kudos, they understand what matters in that organization. So I'm going to send uh, Mooney something for being creative and professional. So I'm going to click those two items off. And then I'd go down here and say, hey, Mooney, you know, uh, you're the best. And when you give recognition, you want to give recognition in a strategic way where you actually identify what they did and how it actually affected uh, you know, the outcome or values of the company. So I'm not going to get into a whole lot of detail here because we only have a limited amount of time. But when you send the kudo, you can send it privately or post it to the company wall. That one just went privately and then it goes down to my personal kudos page where I can see all of the kudos I've given, all the kudos I received, plus my personal profile, which I have control over. And the reason we put the profile in there is so that each of your team members can get to know you better, and it's a great way to actually engage people on their first day of work to make their first day of work a great day at work. And so it's an onboarding process as well. And this feeds really nicely into performance management systems and can integrate with things like Halogen or, or whatever the other products are that people are out there using. So as you can see in here, we have uh, you know, different ways of doing things. And you have your, uh, your personal B card profile. These can be downloaded to your contact stack. So once something's put in here, everyone can share that information. Uh, you can go into the personal details and learn about people. Uh, you can look at education right down to your 20 favorite things. And when you put that in there, then when you do decide to gift somebody something, you can give something that is actually meaningful to them. But the key behind great recognition is timely, meaningful, 
and uh, you know, effective uh, communication in that regard. So we tried to make it as sticky as possible. So we've also included these widget elements on the side so that one of the things was a pet peeve of mine is I'd walk around the office and I wouldn't know where somebody is. I'm just like, does anybody know where Pat is? Where's Pat? And so we put in a status availability information so that anybody can come in at any time and say that I'm in a meeting and then they can actually update their, their status so they can tell people I'm in a meeting at demo camp, letting people know how great recognition is to actually drive performance in their organizations. And then eventually this will be uh, made so that we can push it up to Twitter, push it up to LinkedIn, push it up to Facebook, and it'll be uh, administratively driven. If, if your organization doesn't want you to do that, they can turn that feature off or they can turn that feature on. We also have what we call blue kudos and green kudos. Your blue kudos are kudos that you're allocated every month to give away. Your green kudos are the kudos you collect. And if you run out of blue kudos in a month, you can actually give some of your green kudos. I've got one more minute, so I'm going to finish up here. Uh, we've got our reporting features. We've got the team wall. Uh, we've got uh, you know, the ability to redeem kudos, which is like writing a check. And even in the admin features, some of the stuff that's really super simple and easy, if I wanted to, we, we can put a, a thousand people on this thing in 10 minutes. So if I wanted to go in here and change my logo, change the title, and change the color, I can do that in a heartbeat, and I can also go to various widgets, turn them on and off as I see fit. If I don't want to have the Dilbert of the day, I can just go right in here and make it inactive, save that item, and boom, it's gone. So it's just a really easy to use system that's designed to hit the SME market, 50 to 500, and it's a cloud-based SaaS program that allows everyone at all sizes of organizations to have employee engagement best practices. Thank you. Questions for Tom? Hey Tom, great presentation. Thank you. First question for me is, uh, where does the conversation stand on preloaded actual um, conversation starters or starters or sayings? So instead of just pre-picking your actual little... Um, your characteristics and values? Right, characteristics and values. So then you get to the next part where they say, okay, so, you know, thank you so-and-so for these types of characteristics and values. Then lower below that, would do you auto populate maybe you know five different sayings or something like that? Have yeah, you stuff like about that, that could be done. Like I, I was talking with World Health today, and they actually brought up some good points. And the, the beta clients that we're working with are all giving us fabulous ideas. Uh, they even actually, you know, uh, uh, you know, in this system, you can actually give constructive kudos. You can also give general comments so that you can create threads, and you can like comments, and you can also pile on in a comment. So if I were to send you a kudo and someone else saw it, they go, that's right, you're awesome for these reasons. But you can also use it to collaborate within your office as well. And, you, and we're putting in a groups feature uh, that comes out uh, early March so that we can also create groups so I can send it to these three people or those three people, or you can create an email string of Pat and David and Tom and then send all of them the same amount of kudos. Hey, Tom. Um, I was wondering, uh, first, two questions. First of all, do you guys use, are you guys implementing an API at all? And uh, what kind of, you were talking about other third party uh, yeah, we're, we're going to be bringing API products in uh, later in the year. Uh, we actually have a team in Argentina that's going to be doing that for us. They're creating widgets and API. So we want to work with groups like uh, FreshBooks and, and uh, Nimble and, and uh, Basecamp and things like that, or even Function Point, you know, so that we can create APIs so that people can actually, through those HTML widgets, actually do their time entry or whatever the case may be. But the widgets right now, we have quick links, resources, and a few HTML widgets, plus quick quotes and you know, quote of the day and Dilbert and things like that just to make it fun. Some of the things that you're featuring in your, in your program, the uh, SharePoint is already covering. So for example, having your own little page with you know, right. preferences and these kinds of things. However, I haven't seen them implement any kind of recognition uh, component to it. So my question is, how well does this, um, or is it even possible to integrate that with a SharePoint application? And, uh, and if you're doing it from a cloud point of view, then what are the implications in terms of uh, security? Yeah, so uh, uh, it, it is a secure-based system, an HTTPS scenario, and we do uh, plug into SharePoint and other products where they'll just take the recognition engine and not any of the other elements. AXA Insurance out of the States uses it in that way so for all of their call centers. So they, um, uh, they just have a kudos button on their SharePoint intranet. They click it, it opens up a new browser window, and they just send kudos to one another that way. And they write really funny messages because they are from France. <laughs> Our company uses um, 
kind of a competitor called Tribe HR. I'm not sure if you've heard of them. Yeah, know the Tribe guys. We were down at the uh, C100 with them in Silicon yeah, Valley. Yeah, and uh, we, it has pretty basic kudos type stuff in it. Right. Um, nothing as in depth as your guys' That's um, right. product, which is great. Um, I was taught. What's the dude's name that owns that? The the uh, he was. God, what is his name? I was pumping him for that saying. We got to work together. He kind well, of ignored yeah, me. like I think you guys have a good product, and it seems to draw a lot of employees there. Yeah. Um, have you guys considered adding in features that Tribe has? Because one of them is the vacation time and sick. Um, we buttons. do have we do have sick days, start date, and anniversary dates in there, uh, or we call them wellness days. So you can indicate how many. Uh, one of the things will be this is Kudos Basic. The next level we're bringing is called Kudos Extra, and then Kudos Pro and Kudos Extra. There'll be features like chat, polling, and calendar integration, so that uh, if it's your if it's your uh, anniversary date, it would publish in the calendar. If it's a uh, like last Monday was a, a statutory holiday, it would have been published in the calendar. Things like that to centralize communication. But but we want, don't want to take it too far where you become a, a slave to the beast. You have to keep feeding the beast, right? We want it to be really simple, self-managed, and uh, just meeting the essential needs of an, of an office to stay uh, in touch with one another. Most organizations I've been in, there's um, silos within an organization where that group will be really active using something like that. Yeah. And uh, engagement pieces and recognition. And then the other people that are looking at that actually become resentful and it actually is disengaging so does them. this have an aspect that deals with that yeah i mean it's the reality of any organization well, it, it, of any it, size it's absolutely true like when you look at uh products like kudos or any product the first thing people need to do when they in their organizations is hire for fit and work on their culture and you want to have people that are similar like we do have people within organizations that are uh, uh they don't use kudos a lot, but they do receive a few kudos, and as long as they're not disruptive to the operation, uh, you know, uh, you know, bringing everybody else down or being a disengaged employee, you can try to change an, a disengaged employee to an engaged employee. And if you can't do that, sometimes you just got to move them off the bus because they're doing more damage to your company than uh, positive. But in that same point, uh, you know, we do have uh, what we call rogue departments. Like Miller Coors is a good example. Their IT department out of uh, Boulder, Colorado uses it, but no one else in the organization uses it. And, and that's okay, we're all right going into a 200 person department or location. Uh, and, you know, same thing with University of North Carolina, just their psychology department uses it. And so you'll see people that are a little bit more forward thinking and want to do something more or in addition to other rewards and recognition practices that are in place, and they'll use kudos as that a tool. Is there a mechanism within that that then sort of, I guess, encourages other people, other groups yes. to... You can send kudos outside of the system. So even if you're not in my kudos group, I can send you a kudos message and say, thanks for the great question. Really appreciate it. You're awesome. Five kudos. And then you're like, what the hell's that? That's cool. I got some kudos. And so it's a good viral marketing technique for us as well. And, and so you can send it to clients. You can send it internally. And uh, we usually see a lot of people coming on board and, and digging the product because it's, you know, who doesn't like thanks? And the last question here. By the way, great product. Thank Enjoyed you. listening to you. Because this one has a bit of an HR element to it, yeah, and uh, a bit of compensation as yeah. well. Potential ties in. Have you thought about integrating it with uh, with an ERP type of uh, system? Uh, not, we, because it's, of the address book, because the employees are already set up with yeah. their vacations and, and time off and all that. We stuff. definitely like to go that way in the, in the long Thanks. run, uh, but the uh, the focus right now is just uh, work out all the kinks and kudos basic. Uh, you know, roll it out to that SME market. But the funny thing is, even though we're thinking we're going after 50-person companies, we're getting the Miller Coors and the U University of North Carolinas and the Axe Insurances and the Shaws looking at it. But Shaws only going to put it into their IT or their web dev department to start to look at it. You know, and uh, you know, uh, it's just it's really interesting. You get these rogue departments, but eventually we'd like to integrate with SharePoint more deeply. We'd like to integrate with SAP One. We'd like to integrate with all the various ERP products and the performance management products. All right, thank you, Tom. Forty-nine dollars a month, one dollar per user. Get on Kudos. Yes. Um, if if you're on stage and you have the mic, you gotta sell. So give me your names. Lloyd. Alex. Okay, uh, what are you guys demoing? We're demoing Startup Gauge, essentially a hot or not for startups or your ideas. We came up with this at uh, Calgary Startup Weekend. It was Joyce's idea, Byron and uh, Jessica. They're okay. sitting there. Okay, and stand up, you guys. So, 
All right. Ascent Essentially what the idea started off with was uh, a platform that enables you to beta test your startup. But it was, it was too hard to develop that over two days, so we figured that you know, a hot or not for your ideas would be much better. Came up with a minimum viable product, but our developer ran out of bandwidth, and I relied on my partner. I got to Alex and I said, you gotta help us out. So Alex raises money during the daytime from the government, and at night he's a hacker. So eight hours and he built the whole platform. All right, so just so you guys know, Startup Weekend happened, I think, two weeks ago yep. on the weekend. Starts Friday night and Sunday night sometime. Uh, held over at, at uh, Accelerator YYC. Um, these, this, these teams just got together and created a company over a weekend. Um, DemoCamp offered the winner of Startup, uh, of Startup Weekend a spot here to present. Uh, these guys weren't the winner though, okay? They were, second, they were second place. The reason why the winner isn't presenting tonight is because they violated rule number one. They actually didn't have working product. They only had PowerPoint. So they got the boot. So here we are, second place, but really, they should have won, shouldn't they? Okay, so anyways, five minutes, take her away. So yeah, how many times do you have an idea that pops in your head and you're like, hey, where, what do I do with this? And then a few weeks later, you just drop out, right? And, and then you switch on TV and it's Facebook or it's Google or it's something else. So enter Startup Gauge, essentially hot or not for your ideas. You easily upload a 30 second, 60 second pitch about your idea. People vote cash or crash. And once you've voted, you have the option to collaborate with voters to form a team. Now I was heavily, in, I recently moved here from Philadelphia where the startup space is absolutely booming. And what we found there a lot is, and, and here I'm seeing the same problems, is it's hard, you have an idea, but you can't find a developer, you can't find a designer, the two most difficult people to find. Tons of marketing people, tons of sales people, but hard to find a designer or a developer. So here, this is hot or not meets eHarmony for your idea. So, Vote on your idea, validate it, and then form a team and take it further. So your whole Calgary Startup Weekend is on the web now. So I'll let Alex, uh, as I said, develop this whole thing in eight hours. Yeah, you know, you play Cash or Crash. Uh, you, you can watch the 60 second pitches. So, cash or crash? Crash, crash, all right. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll crash it. All right, so, so basically that's, that's all it is. If you really like the idea, uh, what you can do is you can collaborate. So, because everybody's looking for a partner, um, you, can, uh, you can basically co you know, create an account or log in. So, so yeah, so when you collaborate, you basically just have to give your name, your contact information, Write a little story of why they, why you want to collaborate with them. What are your skills, skill set? Again, if they're looking for sales, which is highly unlikely, then you know most of you guys here are okay. <laughs> um, and you can upload a LinkedIn profile or website, you know, to provide a little more information. Your geographic location, uh, which most of the time doesn't matter, anyways. Uh, so, so basically, that's what it is. Uh, the the individual that uploaded the video can go to collaborations and basically see all the messages for each of the, the pitches that they've uploaded um, and, and uh, a little bit more information about yourself, like your bio that you create on our website, if you like. Uh, in order to upload a video, it's really simple. All you do is you put a title, uh, you paste a LinkedIn or a YouTube video. Um, we didn't want to manage the, the whole video um, um, side of things. We don't want to be narrators and, uh, and worry about copyright and so on. So, uh, you upload a YouTube video and you can tag it for search purposes and uh, that's basically the website. As you click crash or cache, uh, the gauges uh, change and uh, you can also upload comments uh, that, that other visitors can see. So it's, it's, it's very, very basic. So, uh, you know, that's it. Tom, we have more time. Where are you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Questions?
Actually, it's a bit of a comment. Are you familiar with the site Etsy? Yeah, I heard of okay, Etsy. Okay, Etsy, where people who make things get to sell stuff. Yep. There's somebody who uh, actually uh, was part of Etsy as one of the, uh, the sellers on there, and who's actually making a very good living these days by uh, uh, offering information on how to create really good photography, really good descriptions, and everything. So I'm just thinking that there may be there a side opportunity in terms of helping people put uh, presentations that are more compelling and descriptions of the business that would be more compelling in terms of featuring the attributes instead of just the brainstorm. Right, that sounds, sounds great. Some of the other feedback we got was entrepreneurs within companies, uh, they have ideas, but they want to bring on developers and whatnot, talk about company culture, they post a 30 or 60 second video and appeal to the people, hey, join our team, we're working on this cool product, this idea. You guys have the ability to collaborate, but I was wondering if and this kind of goes along with her suggestion, maybe, uh, whether you have the ability to comment or uh, post some sort of criticism. And hopefully, you know, I mean, obviously on YouTube, sometimes it can end up pretty harsh. But uh, I, when I first saw this, I could see it as a um, mechanism for posting, hopefully, constructive criticism in order for people to improve their pitch, even if it's even if they're not a huge fan of the idea. So I was wondering if you guys had thought of that as well. Yeah, there's, there, there's functionality to, to just comment. As long as you log in, you can just uh, post a comment similar to YouTube. Do you have any kind of figures as to uh, um, how many responses um, mean, have more meaning? So for example, if you get 40 responses, well, your answer is, just like when you do uh, surveys, for example, yeah. you say this is within 1.2% of, you know, that kind of stuff. So I'm really into measurements, about measuring you know, anything. And in this, I would say, if you get 40 answers, where is the likelihood that the answers are true? To what percentage? So can you believe that to 20%? That kind of stuff. Well, that, that's, that's a cool data question, right? So <laughs> as people use it, you can, you can pull that data out and create all types of answers to, to questions like that, right? For future development purposes, I mean, how easy is it for you guys to create a membership program out of this? Because it has the potential to create a very nice community, a very engaged community, obviously, and to be able to kind of retain them. And I mean, what about turning it into, um, or not turning it into, but using access points like certain tabs for members only that are, I mean, instead of just doing comments, what about actual, you know, little reports, little white papers saying this is how you can be a better pitcher, this is how you can be a better startup person. I mean, is that something that is feasible in what you guys have put together so far? So next weekend we're hosting Bose Capital Startup Weekend. We, we hack on stuff every weekend, so. Uh, other plans are uh, social integration with Facebook and Twitter. I just voted, uh, I just cashed on this idea. You should come check it out. Uh, my the previous startup that I worked for, Ticket Leap, we had, it was an event management platform where anytime somebody buys a ticket, it posts on Facebook and Twitter, I'm going to this event. And we saw that for every one post, every seven posts of uh, I'm going on Facebook and Twitter, it generated a sale versus a like or a regular share is like 70, 80. So definitely doing something like that, getting more buzz, getting more people talking about it, for sure. Definitely. All right, how about a round of applause? Thank you. All right, so next up we have Christian. DailyChildcareReport.com. It's a communication tool for all daycares. Okay, and you used to be a, um, a guy behind one of the, you know, one of the more successful startups in, uh, in Calgary, a company called Tint, right? Yeah, I was pretty much uh, the first developer at Tint. What, what is it supposed to do? So I have a two-year-old son, and okay. he is going to daycare, and so scenarios, I pick him up, he sees me, he wants my 100% attention. So if I uh, try to talk to the teacher to find out how his day was, he gets upset with me and I have first temper tantrum, which is no good. Also, the teachers, their obligation is to look after all the other kids. They don't really have time to talk to the parents how, uh, about their kids. So, you know, oftentimes I just pick him up, go home, and then he's cranky. You know, he doesn't eat his dinner. And my wife is like, well, why doesn't he eat his dinner? Didn't he eat lunch? Did he maybe not nap today? And I just shrug, and then my wife is upset at me. So um, I try to solve that. Uh, OK, before doing that, of course, I talk to other parents, find out that it's just a personal problem or a common problem. Turns out it's a common problem. Some parents are unhappy. And some teachers are unhappy about the situation as well. So it's uh, commonly acknowledged. So All right. So we'll give you five work. minutes to do it. By the way, I was, I was having a conversation with, a, um, with an entrepreneur in, uh, in Edmonton last week 
um, he's a coder, and I asked him, like, what's your worldview? How do you solve problems? Right? And he says that for every problem in the world, there's code that will solve that problem, right? And I think that's the solution that we have here. So Christian, take away, five minutes. Most parents in Canada, they are on Facebook, so of course they can sign up and log in with their Facebook account. I'm just logging in with the test account here. So this is how it looks like for parents. Um, so there's a request like, you know, should bring in new diapers for my virtual son, Andrew Lepper. Um, there is a, they can, teachers can write personal comments for the, for the individual kids. So in this case, you know, Andrew was singing lots. And um, there are comments for all the kids in the group. Um, and then, um, so kids, they are usually grouped into rooms and daycares, depending on their age. And uh, so for each age range, there are different things that uh, you can track in daily childcare reports. So in this case, um, we're tracking um, how well they ate, how well they slept, and their bowel movements. So here we have morning snack in this uh, today's report was good. And we have some trending down here. Blue is uh, trending for Andrew. And you can compare it to the average in their group. So and you know it's just either fair, good, or great. Um, Lunch, you know, he had a great lunch, and you can even find out what they had today. Again, some trending. Sleep, not so good sleep. And you can see also here, like on average, it's not a great sleeper. Afternoon snack, again, what they had. And the uh, last trend, you can see that Andrew is a really good pooper. And um, yeah, and then, uh, you know, you can take a look at past reports. Um, this is just some test data here. Sorry, I'll show you a real report in a moment. Um, parents can also uh, send notes to the daycares, like, uh, you know. Uh, He's sick today. Won't come in instead of uh, calling. OK, so um, not super exciting for parents, except you know, of course, you get the information. So. Um, so for um, this is how it looks like for teachers. Um, the uh, report writing, I've uh, played around like with different UIs. This is what I ended up with. It's basically just the big S form um, where they um, fill out the uh, data for every child just on one page. Uh, that turned out to be the most efficient. So like uh, morning snack section, for example, you know, I can just uh, quickly go through here. Um, and um, so this uh, UI is kind of optimized for iPad usage. Um, my first customer, the daycare my son goes through, they have actually purchased iPads for every room and are using this and filling this out now. So here's the lunch, sec lunch section. There's some shortcuts here, like, uh, you know, let's say most of them had a good lunch and then just some exceptions here. Like, uh, this one wasn't there. Sleep, let's say, uh, you know, the way they slept today was pretty much like they slept yesterday, so you can just copy yesterday's uh, report over instead of tapping it individually, except, you know, this one wasn't there, and Lilo had a great nap. Uh, afternoon snack, okay, I don't need to fill out the whole thing here. Um, you can tap on needs, so in this group, you know, they can, can request parents to bring, like, replacement clothes, or there was some incident, and parents need to sign uh, an incident report. Um, you can give individual comments, like, uh, ooh, that's all I wanted. Um, okay, whatever. You get the idea. Um, once the uh, once the diaper is off, you know we can track toilet training accidents, so parents can uh, keep an eye on that. Um, what was for food? Cream chicken, maybe. Afternoon snack. Masher sounds good. You can uh, write a comment to the whole group, or not. Safe. Um, that's really the main screen for teachers. Um, other functionality I have for more like for managers of daycares is um, you know, I have all this data now, so let's let's make it available so they can see some trends for the individual rooms. So in in this case, this uh, this daycare has three groups: the butterflies, busy bees, and the ladybugs. And you can kind of compare how they are doing over time. Um, there's some other stuff here for managing metadata that's not too exciting to show. Uh, I can just show you quickly my um, the real report. Um, so parents can um, just go online 
to check the report whenever it's available, or they can uh, subscribe to get emails or SMS messages to their phone or Facebook messages. And uh, so if they go online, UI kind of adjusts automatically, so I usually check it on my iPhone. And this is my son here, and this is his report. And That's five minutes. Yeah. You know, you know what's uh, you know what's interesting about this is that is that at my work we also track lunch and bowel movements. So <laughs> this, this is really awesome. good stuff. Okay, qu questions for Christian. What kind of feedback have you received from uh, parents as well as teachers? Um, it, it used to be just one sided, so just uh, from uh, information from uh, teachers to parents, uh, because that's really what I personally wanted to first. But then more and more parents requested that they also wanted to use it to send information to the daycares. So that's what I did last week and hope to improve next week. So for your beta testing, um, great presentation again. Love the product. I know many, many, many single parents that would love this mm -hmm. um, just to be able to help manage. And, and in, because it reflects what they're already doing, it makes it a lot easier to assimilate into the regular routine, which I'm sure they love. Um, have you been practicing with privately owned daycares, or have you taken a look at you know, a YWCA system to kind of test and to see what the resilience is in a public scale as opposed to private? Um, so most, most daycares are actually nonprofit, and uh, they just have one center. So that's what I'm focusing on first, uh, but I hope to uh, expand this soon to like, uh, you know, like corporations like uh, Kids and Company that have different centers. Right now, I don't really support that the Facebook login as a parent. Yeah. I'm very concerned of having my child's information available on Facebook. Is Facebook is only it, used for login? It's only used for login, and if you want, the reports are being sent as a Facebook message, but those Facebook messages are private. It doesn't go up on your wall or anything, and it's, it's an opt-in. How about a round of applause for Christian? Thank you very much. We have, um, we have an Ignite presentation coming up from, from David, except um, he's going to do it in half the time. <clears throat> so essentially, I work for a company named Black Square. We deal with wine and technology. Essentially, at our office, we get wine dropped off every day. We taste between 50 to 100 bottles of wine at any given month. And we have to photograph, taste, comment, record, and figure out what we're going to use every single month, which equates to me trying to solve this problem by writing a software app in one hour which I tweeted about back in November. So numerous issues here. One, it's ridiculously fast to build a web app, let alone one that completely functions. But two, why am I going to do this? Well, I want to get all the data in one place, and I want to make it really easy for the rest of our team to collaborate. So we have about six or seven people, everyone touching all the data, and we have to publish this data at some point, either in print, web, et cetera. Um, so normally this process, um, I have a bit of a product design background. Actually, I have a product design background. I would sketch stuff out on paper and then try and make it into HTML and then jump into code. This time, not so much. I just jumped into code. So to do that, you can just do this from scratch. You can build your own <laughs> library. That's ridiculous. It's going to take you far more than an hour just to do that. So I'm leveraging Drupal. There's also other tools out there, such as Ruby on Rails or Joomla or whatever your preference is. I know Drupal quite well, so I decided to just jump into it. So essentially, with this tool, I could work from the core in. In this case, what's the most important thing? One wine, and then many wines, and then filtering wines. And then there's some other stuff on top of that. But that's essentially the core of the product I'm trying to build. So while building the tool, I'm actually using the tool. And by using the tool, I can then turn on other modules so I can make things a little bit more complicated and leverage other people's open source contributions in terms of the Drupal world, for example. So managed to get this working. It's all good. But essentially, what I decided after I did this was I had to deploy and get my team using it the very next day. I started this at 9 PM, got done just before 10 o'clock, deployed it, started using it with our team at uh, 8 o'clock the next day. So the message here is, if you can do this, get buy-in, get people using it, you're going to learn a ton about how to build your product, how to use your product, and this will be your V1 if you can do it properly. Thanks very much. Doesn't take an entire weekend to start a company, does it? Slackers. Um, OK, so um, Adrian. Um, I don't see a computer up here. Can you tell us what you're going to demo? My demo didn't fit in this building, unfortunately. Okay. It's a, an 80,000 liter photobioreactor, so it's something completely different. Um, 
and okay. the, it'll be the blue screen of death the whole time. Okay, got <laughs> it. Uh, basically, we're just trying to get the word out of uh, what we've been, been up to in Manchester Industrial for the last four years. Uh, there's other uh, startups in Calgary other than uh, the IT industry where... Uh, no! <laughs> Shut up! I work for a company called SFN Biosystems. Uh, we're a startup based in Calgary and we're a startup one of the, the world's oldest industries and that's the agricultural industry. Basically our proje project started because we saw an opportunity. Um, the opportunity being natural gas compressor stations. Uh, I found it ironic actually we're right next to Encana which is uh, one of the Alberta's, Alberta's biggest producer of natural gas. And they have compressor stations that burn a portion of that natural gas to pump it to the, the markets, uh, such as the States or Eastern Canada. And when this natural gas is burned, it generates massive amounts of carbon dioxide and heat. So we have these two waste streams um, in concentrated areas. So there's 5,000 of these in, in Alberta. And nobody's doing that with anything with them. So this is, this is the opportunity, concentrated waste streams. SFN saw a way to extract value from these waste streams, and that is algae. So this is the only demo part I have. I brought some algae with me. So in each one of these uh, half liter bottles is three billion microalgae. And we actually have, take that and pass around, take a look at it. Try not to spill it too much. So we have 6,000 liters of that back at our facility. Algae is one of the uh, planet's most efficient plants. It's much more efficient than tomatoes, which is what we were initially going to use to utilize CO2 and heat. Um, so SFN is going to use these waste streams at natural gas compressor stations as inputs to algae farms. So we supply light and nutrient, as well as those two waste streams, and algae grows like mad. It, it doubles two to four times a day. And this algae is worth money as protein and as lipids. And we also generate revenue with uh, the CO2 credits, the carbon credits. So basically we are farming with, with free inputs. So now the execution. As I mentioned, SFN has been, been around for a few years. We've been operational in Manchester Industrial for about four years. We're very low key. For, for 20 months, we did uh, proof of concept testing and algae selection. There's actually over 300,000 different species of algae. And the one you're holding, it took a long time for our bio biologists to narrow down and decide which one. It's based on CO2 uptake and protein content and a whole bunch of stuff I don't understand. For the last 10 months, we've been actually building this large photobioreactor. So this is a full-scale demonstration unit. It's 80,000 liters. It has 144 eight-foot T8 fluorescent bulbs. It's got 256 bubblers in it. We have a 125 kilowatt genset that produces exhaust and heat, and this is our mock compressor station because you can't just buy one. They're worth millions and millions of dollars. So this system we built with minimal contractors and minimal outside help. So I personally did the welding. Our chemical engineer did the painting and laid the pipe. We had interns shoveling gravel, assembling light arrays, and, and various other uh, backbreaking labor. But we view it, you know, we learn a lot from executing on our design. And if you're gonna, if you're gonna build something new, you have to build it yourself or else you go broke, paying somebody else doing it. Future plan. So like I uh, mentioned, we, uh, we built this uh, large 80,000 liter photobioreactor and we were just going into operation this week or next week. So we're putting 6,000 liters of algae into that system and, and start the operation. The system is fully automated, so uh, if anybody has an experience with plant automation, come talk to me. Um, and we'll verify our economics with this full-scale demonstration unit, as well as concurrently design our, our pilot plant, and this will be a 40 of the systems we just completed, they'll go on an actual natural gas compressor station. It will be 3.2 million liters of algae and produce about 20 tons of, of dried biomass per day. So in the past uh, few years, SFN has learned a lot about manufacturing, we've learned a lot about algae, and we've learned a lot about being a startup in Calgary. And we plan to learn a lot, of, a lot more about being a startup, and that's what it's all about, right? 
Um, basically, this is uh, SFN in five minutes. Um, I brought a whole bunch of uh, pictures because I was told I couldn't do a PowerPoint. So please come talk to myself or the chemical engineer critique, and we'll give you a lot more information. But thank you for your time. Great presentation with no slides. I like <laughs> thank you. Um, one of the questions I had, I, I'm not sure if I understood correctly, are you looking at displacing current compressor stations, or is this an add-on? No, th this, this would be an add-on. So the way it would uh, appear is there would be their uh, lease, which is an oil and gas lease, and we'd be adjacent to them. And the only thing going across into our facility is the, the CO2, or the exhaust, the unprocessed exhaust, and then some process heat we take uh, using uh, glycol, glycol okay. water. Um, so the National Research Council is actually doing a massive national program on this. Yeah, as well, uh, there's that. other organizations, a consortium across Canada doing things, and I've been involved with this. So yeah. I'm wondering uh, where you're at in terms of separating the microalgae and processing it into the lipids, which is, for the rest of us, it's biodiesel, um, and also the carbohydrates and proteins. Where are you at in terms of your technologies for the separation of that? So great, you can grow it, but what about the separation? <laughs> well, that's, that's a very excellent question. I didn't expect, yeah. Um, <laughs> so we've been uh, manufacturing, we've, we've made the photobioreactor, like you say, we can, we can grow it. Um, algae is small and it has the same density as water. So like, like you mentioned, it's extremely difficult to separate it using uh, centrifuge or other uh, conventional methods of, of separation. But there are methods that are currently being developed. The algae world, and there are algae conferences which are pretty dorky, but uh, is, is uh, advancing quite rapidly. So there's a lot of technologies that are, that are being developed for the separation, energy efficient, um, chemically efficient. Um, there are numerous technologies we've identified that will work uh, as far as our uh, economic means so the, and energy input means, um, those being like pH flocculation, um, uh, dissolved air flotation, there's other methods. What we're doing now is we're going into uh, op operation of our growth facility and we're going to evaluate those technologies um, right next to each other. Because until you generate a whole bunch of algae, you can't, you can ask them how well it works and they'll promise you something, but, but it, you have to see and believe it, right? So that, we are going to evaluate that. One quick follow up, yeah. are you doing an open system, like an open no. system, or is it a closed no. tubular? So these natural gas compressor stations run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, up north. So what we have is a closed photobioreactor, which is basically just a big insulated tank with lights on the inside. So the system operates 24 hours a day. So it's a closed photobioreactor, and that also keeps heat in and the sparrows out, or whatever else wants to go swimming. Yeah, just sort of for the general layman, uh, what is the product produced from this process? And so that she'd mentioned biodiesel, is that? Well, the, the product is, is algae, as far as we're concerned. And then from then on, it can go into numerous things. One of the uh, algae companies that's actually making money is producing uh, uh, cosmetics. But basically, you have protein, a really basic form of plant protein that you can do whatever you want with. And then you have oil or lipids that you can do whatever you want with. One of the big drivers uh, down in the States is, uh, is biofuels. So they want to be you know, greener, greener uh, fuel. So the US Navy wants biofuels by 2020. That's just one product. There's value in other products as well. Um, so compressor stations are very kind of distributed all over and very remote. Is there a reason you kind of targeted those versus some other kind of large centralized uh, heat sources? Um, this technology will work on anything that uh, burns natural gas, uh, sweet natural gas. Um, and compressor stations were uh, an obvious fit. There are things, other uh, di uh, distributed systems are, that have localized streams of exhaust gas, like large power plants, but those are orders of magnitude bigger than, than the compressor stations we're looking at. We chose, I guess, the, the low-hanging fruit first, and this was the easiest one to go on most dependable uh, exhaust streams. Uh, we understand them the most because uh, principles come from an oil and gas background. 
and the, the it, they burn clean natural gas, so the exhaust is free of uh, harmful contaminants that coal would be, or or other fuel, or other fuels like diesel. Uh, the question that I have is, um, I know that, for example, right now there's some work being done out of the University of Edmonton in terms of using algae to uh, clean tailing ponds. Um, but, you know, it's still in the works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but my question is more in terms of uh, environmental impact. As we know, accidents happen. Yeah. And uh, what, uh, what do you have in place in case, because I'm assuming that a lot of these algae are actually not indigenous to uh, Alberta, uh, if something happens, it leaks in the water and destroys the ecological balance. That's, a, that's an excellent question. So I mentioned that we did 20 years of, or sorry, 20 months of, uh, of research and, and species selection. And part of that was evaluating the species that were um, uh, native, non-toxic, and we, obviously, we didn't choose to go down the genetically modified route. So the algae I passed around, although they didn't write the species number on it, is uh, a native non-toxic species to Alberta. And we chose it for that reason. Now, I'm not saying that if you had a toxic genetically modified algae, you couldn't mitigate your risk such that you could grow it. We just chose not to go down that road route you know, as a startup. Eventually, it might go that route that it will be growing genetically modified, but now we, we don't do that. And if you do go to our facility in uh, uh, Manchester Industrial, we have uh, secondary containment systems set up so that we're not going to dump a bunch of algae down the sewer into the bow, uh, even though it's native and non-toxic. So we've, we've mitigated that risk and we're not, we're not going there. All right. Thank you, Adrian. Yeah. If you guys did touch that bottle, you'll want to be like extra careful over the next couple of days. I'm Kevin Timms. Steve Bentley. Um, we're from QR's app, and uh, what we're doing is uh, we're putting together a, uh, basically it's a, um, a marketing platform for uh, small to medium-sized organizations. And uh, what we're doing is leveraging mobile technology, mobile tagging technology, hyperlinks, QR codes. What we've seen out there is uh, some solutions that are uh, uh, customizable and uh, they're, uh, you know, the price models are pretty high and then inflexible solutions that solutions that are cheap and what Steve's going to show you today is uh, something we found that uh, we think is good for the sweet spot. The niche that we've chosen is bar and restaurant so if you see what we're doing and you like it and want to provide that to somebody at a very cut rate with a high level of customization and engagement from us then uh, we'd be interested in, in, in talking with somebody on it. All right so Steve are you doing the demo? Yep. Take her away you got five minutes. Okay so first of all bring into our uh, editor space I see a weird blue line there. Well, you don't see it up there, so that's great. So basically, uh, this is the space. Once you've created an account, you can go in here. You can easily change any of the informa information that you're seeing on that uh, the mobile device. What you see on the device um, demonstrated there will show up on when somebody scans that code or you send this space around to other people. There's a bunch of different ways that we can do that, and I can show you how that goes. The first tab that we have is the properties tab, so that is ba your basic your, your contact information. You've got your email, your phone. If you click those buttons on your mobile device, then it will instantly dial the phone for you. It will instantly punch the email in for you, so you don't have to plug in that information. You can put a Google Map link in there. It shows where your business is, a YouTube video demonstrating your product, your website, a tagline at the bottom, as well as a title at the top. That's a completely fictional bar that we're uh, that we use as a as a template for that. So then, if you wanted to change anything on here, you'd hit the design tab. So for the design tab, basically these images that you're seeing are just simple JPEGs that you can pull off of your desktop if needs be. You simply choose a file, you select a file from your desktop as you're used to doing, press update, and basically update is the exact same thing as saving your work. You don't want to get too far ahead without updating, or else you get yourself in trouble. Um, background image is also a simple JPEG, so there's a lot of flexibility in how you can present yourself. Coloring for all the coloring and customization for all the buttons, as well as you, we've got transparency of buttons, rounded corners, etc. Basically, if you want to change the colors of anything, it's easy to do. So, for example, I'm going to select here. Let's pick a hideous green instead of the red, and then we update. And so the code always stays the same, but you're able to change this on the fly. So every day. If you wanted to have new information, or you could do something completely different, <laughs> which is part of Demo Camp, I guess. 
let's see what happens if I do this. Okay, so everything's fully customizable. Fully customizable. So once you've changed, there we go. Well done. We need new laptops, so that's part of that funding that we were talking about. Um, so uh, yeah, so once you're able to change, fully customize everything that's in that space, and that's going to enable you to provide new information if you want to do it every day, if you want to do it every week, if you want to never change it, you can do that. But what some of the, the pilots that we're involved with so far are liking is that they can change it on the go, provide new information, say, on who's performing there that week or who their, what their specials are that week, and they can change everything around. Once this thing starts booting around, I'm not sure if it's, if it's our web connection or uh, everything worked perfect in practice today, so that's, uh, that's always good. Um, so another function that we have in there, it didn't change it to, so I'm going to do that again just to show you I can do it. Uh, what's that, a minute? Okay, so I'm going to not do that, not change that, but uh, we also have an HTML editor, so rather than a bunch of buttons, you could describe the upcoming events, and et cetera. You, could, you can customize what your message is. Uh, there's also custom links, so you can fill it up with as many links you want to have in there, but you also get to name those buttons, so it just doesn't say www.whatever, it can be whatever your message is. We have vCard functionality, we have geo geolocation. Uh, I want to show you our analytics. We've got a bunch of other stuff, but I did spend a lot of time mucking around with, uh, with what we, uh, with where we were there. So, um, so for analytics, basically we're able to track where it's being scanned, when it's being scanned, what type of device is scanning it from Blackberries to iPhones, also new versus returning users. Okay, so we've got some, some funkiness going on here. Um, but uh, yeah, so basically we've created a platform so that you are able to engage in the mobile marketplace and use the uh, physical hyperlinks and QR codes to reach clients that you may or may not have been able to reach before. And that'll do it. <laughs> Other family. Paul, do you want to come up and set up? Uh, questions? Um, I've actually worked with you guys before, Stacy with Alberta Buzz. You guys have done a QR code for me. So right, first right. out, shout out, you guys do great work. Thank you. Uh, and congratulations. Um, I'm curious, actually, because this year, the biggest buzz has been a lot of app developers coming up with individual apps for different restaurants and bars, and they're incorporating QR code coupons into those apps. Are you working with those developers? Is that something that you guys are looking at? We're kind of rolling the dice as far as how much people want to have a load of apps on their phone. And we've decided to go for a web-based app because uh, I myself hate having a bunch of things on my phone. I'm trying to limit that. So that's why we went for a web-based app as opposed to uh, an app-based app, for lack of a better term. But uh, having said that, it's a flexible platform and it can be utilized in a lot of different ways. So if anybody does actually have a QR code with yours, can they amalgamate that QR code into any app that they are developing? Uh, it would, I guess it would depend on how that, that separate app works. But uh, basically, if you're able to load up, like our QR code is just a, like a JPEG, or actually, if I had more time and I could show you, uh, you're able to download different file types. So, so long as that app can handle you know, those three or four file types, and it should be okay. So you're generating QR codes, right? But on your page, you had a, what looked like an iPhone. Is there also a separate mobile scanning app with that, or do you just generate QR codes? We decided not to get into the heavily saturated uh, code scanning um, app market. Uh, there's a number of good ones, and uh, basically what we've learned so far is there's no sense in me telling you all to download a certain type of app for, for your phone, because each phone has a number of apps that, are, that are, are decent for it. So if you do a search in your phone, you go into App World or wherever the hell it is, it'll give you a number. And my, our, our, our advice is don't pay for it. There's a lot of, there are, every free one we've used is, is excellent, so long as it's highly rated. So you want to go highly rated and free. Plans on working with NFC or anything like that? With where, sorry? NFC, New Field Communication Chips. We've certainly thought about it, and uh, there's a lot of stuff that we have, we're, we want to have, you know, that's sort of coming down the pipe. Um, one of the things that's coming up very soon for us is, uh, or at least we're, we're starting to work towards, is um, computational photography. So we would be able to create the pages, st similar to what you saw up there, but with computational photography. Is everybody familiar with that stuff? Or, Anyways, if it's a Coke can in my hand and you've programmed it properly, then you have an app on your phone, it just has to recognize the logo. 
and then that will shoot, that will, once you've scanned that, that'll shoot you through to that page if you program that properly. So basically, the system that we have here is going to adapt to any of these new technologies that are coming out there, and we'll be building that in, so rather than you having an account and having to create all these new different things, we're just going to adapt to those technologies as they come in. Uh, it, the final thing that I would just say is that I've heard about this event a few times. We're at Accelerator YYC, and I really, really like it. I think it's a very cool environment, and kudos to you guys. All not, right, thank not you. kudos, but... Thank you. you know. <laughs> My name's Paul. Okay, Paul, uh, what are you here to demo for us? I'm here tonight to demo Anthem. Okay. And Anthem is a... Well, that's, that's where I'll roll into my pitch. Oh, so you don't want to <laughs> say right now. Yeah, you okay. know, I don't want to give away the ending. We could, you know. <laughs> and in the next five minutes, you'll find out what it is. Take her away, Paul. All right, so yeah, as I said, I'm Paul. I'm one of four founders of Anthem. The other three being in Winterpeg, so they didn't want to make the trip out here today. Um, you may have recently seen us on TechCrunch, BBC, and The Guardian. We launched last Friday, and we're fortunate enough to get coverage from those, so that was quite nice. Just a side note, buildstudios.ca is who you want for your website. There are a couple of friends and they will nail that for you. So a little, little promo pitch for buds. Uh, so what is Anthem? Anthem is music by democracy. People control the music in the places that they go. So in the past, you know, if you go to a party or a wedding or you're even on a road trip, you can't necessarily control that 99% of the time. So that's what Anthem is, and it's backed by RDO. So it's actually Anthem powered by RDO. And the difference is, if you have your iTunes collection, it's probably sloppy, messy, and incomplete, and your friends probably don't like the same music that you do. So it's backed by RDO, which is a streaming music service that has 12 million songs behind it. So that's a differentiator. It allows everybody to vote the songs that they like. So what I'm going to do is jump right in, because I think it shows itself awful lot better than I can talk about it. So what we're looking at right here is a list of nearby parties. You can basically either join a party or host a party. So in this case, we're going to host a demo, uh, demo camp party. And we'll give it a password, because otherwise we found that you generally get rickrolled quite frequent, so <laughs> put a password on. Once I start the party, this is basically the party list that I'm walking. And Anthem's going to wait there for a second and go, are you starting the party? Are you requesting songs? And if not, Anthem's going to be so kind to go into my RDO collection and pull out songs from it, which is nice because it's not just going to randomly pick them. It's going to pick music that I like, at least to get the party started. Once that music gets in the queue, you can vote it up and you can vote it down. You, can, you can't do more than two votes and you can't downvote it more than once. So you can end up being plus one, zero, or minus one. So you can see, I finally pulled up some songs, realizing that we're pretty slow to start. First thing I see is, well, I actually like Kill, so I'd like that to play next. So I'm going to give it an upvote. And you can see it pops up in the queue. So now, instead of being the second song, it's the next song up. And The Answer Was You by Sloan was a song that was playing when I was choking on an orange, so I hate that song. Oh, somebody voted it up. Oh, no. So I'm, I'm going to use Go to Sleep by Radiohead. Actually, I want to vote that down. See, so you, you can see now it's minus one, so it's gone to the bottom of the queue. So that's the basic democracy there. It's super simple. It's super easy. There's not a lot of complicated stuff. You like it or you don't. You're going to hear the music that everybody wants to hear. Maybe it's not the music you want, but you've been overruled by majority. Now, that's songs that were auto-populated but I may want a new one. Thanks. So in this case, I'm going to request Baker Street, which if any of you know is the one that starts off with that romantic sax. So we're going to get some romantic sax going and set the mood for us here. So I've just requested Baker Street, and Baker Street now shows up in there. So I'm going to join this party on my iPad here. Actually, there's already five people in it, which is super cool. So I just joined the party, and then you can see that I've got all the songs there, so I'm going to vote up Baker Street. Now Baker Street has two votes, and it's going to refresh here on the host. And then Baker Street will jump up into the next slot. So that's basically it. Uh, the host also has the ability to just jump in and pause music, skip music, and tweet it if they want. Anyone can tweet it, but the host can actually pause it and skip songs. So we're about 30 seconds away from hearing some epic sax, but that is Anthem in a nutshell.
There's not a lot to it, it's simple. All it does is facilitate your party and make sure that people can vote for songs and hear the songs that they want to listen to. So the future for Anthem is uh, three main things. First of all, uh, we're going to add support for Spotify, which has a lot a larger user base. We did REO first because they support Canadians, which is really nice. Uh, so we like that. And we're uh, also going to release our mobile web version. So that spreads the democracy to all smartphone users. Right now, it's just the fanboys. We got the votes, which is cool. But in the future, not too distant future, you'll be able to vote on any smartphone that has a web browser, basically. And the third and last thing is we're going to enable our merchant accounts, which just allows merchants to control little bits of Anthem. They can't dictate music, but they get analytics on the people that are coming in, what the people in their establishment want to listen to, and they can push ads. I was actually thinking of a similar one a couple weeks ago, and it's actually cool to see someone who actually has like a finished product. Um, are you going to, and this is kind of what I was thinking a couple weeks ago, in the future or in the near term, is there going to be functionality where people who have songs on their phone can somehow, you know, send it to this list and then other people can vote on it? So you're saying a song that would not be in the RDO playlist, for example? Yeah, or? so everyone nowadays has a phone with songs on them, right? So I don't know if there's going to be functionality or capability for someone like me, let's say, said, oh, you know what, I'm listening to this song right now. Is there any way to shoot it up on that list and then get people to vote? Out of the gate, we wanted to start with RDO and Spotify because the problem with people's own personal collections is the met metadata on the songs isn't always nice. And it also may not be, you know, you may have 30 songs in your collection, you may have 200, so it may not be inclusive of what everyone else likes. So that's why we kind of ruled that out. It's not that we won't ever do it, but as far as like taking iterations of the product, that was cut out for version one. Uh, cloud storage is becoming the next frontier for, uh, for music, uh, uh, access to music. Is this something that you're taking into consideration in terms of access, meaning being going way beyond basically what you've got in your phone or what you have in your, uh, in your own hard drive or anywhere? So RDO, unlike many streaming music services, actually allows you to download all the music from your RDO collection onto your phone and have it for offline storage. So that's one of the main things why we chose it. Although with the nature of the app, you really need some kind of network connectivity anyways because you're voting, right? So, um, but that is one reason we chose RDO. So at least on a local n network in the future, you could have that without touching the clouds. You have to be subscribed to RDO though? Currently you do. And that's actually one of the, the ways the app is free, but we get 3% of every RDO subscription that comes through it. So. It looks like there's some aspects of like group listening. So is it only the hosts that can listen or can like everybody that has a phone like anywhere in the world listen to kind of like the playlist wherever they are? Right, and that is actually another thing that we kind of cut out for version one, just wanting to get it released. So in the future, we will have what we call a shared playlist. So it'll basically say, okay, you're all hosts. And then in that case, it'll actually take the seconds in the song and synchronize all that data. So you're listening it to it together. So. That's coming in the future, but again, was just one of the things we skimmed so we could release. Can we get uh, contact information if we wanted to just send you a couple of free QA stuff we have already? Yeah, 100%. In fact, afterwards, I, I have two iPads with just six little, six pager on uh, data with us, and I have a bunch of business cards. So you can just swing by. I'll set up out there, and you can come pick some up. All right. Thank you, Paul. How about a round of applause? We get a lot of applications for these. I think for, for those of you who are thinking of applying, we probably get two or three applications for every spot that we have on, on Demo Camp. So, but we do want you to, to get your airtime with the community. Uh, we do encourage the community to help you out. So in that spirit, we want you to apply. We want you to go to DemoCampCalgary.com and, uh, and put yourself on the mail list. Tell us about companies that you want to see up on stage. So thank you very much. Oh, sorry, preemptive, preemptive. Whoa, 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 whoa. So earlier when I did the Ignite, thanks for listening to that, I really appreciate it. I did want to toss out a challenge because it doesn't seem like you guys seem too keen on presenting one, right? Is anyone keen? Okay, well anyway, if you are keen or thinking about it, I am gonna donate uh, one of our wine collective packages, which is worth probably around 100 bucks, that's four bottles of wine, to the first person that can actually pitch Patrick and myself on actually doing an Ignite at the next demo camp. So that offers out there. If you're interested, please get in touch. Thanks a lot, guys.
Thank you. Good night.